Welcome, you happy warriors, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Thank you for being part of the show, and thank you, as always, for telling somebody about the show, because you've been doing a fabulous job of promoting the show during the year 2021, uh, the end of which is now rapidly approaching, and that means that it's time for me to offer my five predictions for 2022. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm i very proud of being able to have this privilege of speaking to you every single week. And uh, it's not just speaking to you on the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show, but it's realizing that we are now the only show on the entire Internet that is officially approved by the U.N., that's the United Nations. We're officially approved by the uh, IPCC. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we're officially approved by OPEC, O-P-E-C, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. So those are three really important endorsements that make me feel that we're doing something truly valuable in making the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show available to all. But uh, enough of all that flim flam and time now for me to remind you that the entire purpose of this show is to make available to you the full revelation of how the world really works. And so when I announce my five predictions for the year 2022, I am not doing that to come across as a prophet. No, I'm not doing it in order to be a smart futurist. No, I am looking into the year ahead only for one reason, and that is that each one of you happy warriors focused on your five Fs, focused on your family and on your faith and on your finances and on your friendships and on your fitness, that you can make the very best choices for the year ahead, for the year 2022. There are going to be many decisions you're going to have to make with respect to your family with respect to your fitness, with respect to your finances and your friendships, your social life, and yes, even your faith. And in order to be equipped for that in the best possible way, I decided to be as helpful as I can be to you, my dear listeners, by providing you with my five most important predictions for the year ahead. Now, let it just be said that in order to make predictions, it's also very important not to take oneself too seriously because the truth is that uh, predictions are notoriously unreliable. And this is part of the sheer joy and excitement of being a part of, of humanity, to be a human being created by God, touched by the finger of God, made quite different from every other form of life on the planet. And that means that our ability to outstrip our own imagination is completely unlimited. And that's me, that means that, yes, the things you can accomplish in the year ahead are beyond your ability to imagine. And that's an awesome thought when you think about it, isn't it? Because it means that as long as you set yourself on an upward path, and as long as you perform regular weekly audits of how you're doing on the family front and on the faith front, because faith is absolutely vital in order to flourish in the other four Fs, and you perform your weekly audits, measuring how well you're doing on finances, or on friendships, and on your fitness, well, then things could happen in this following year that take you into orbit 
that take you onto new plateaus, that elevate you beyond anything you even imagine for yourself. And that's the lesson I take from the false and mistaken predictions of the past. And whenever I'm set to make my predictions, I always take another look at my little list of of predictions that didn't work out too well. And I do that as a humbling reminder that no matter how hard I work on these predictions and no matter how much research I do and no matter how much ancient Jewish wisdom I bring to bear on the challenge, there is still a very strong likelihood of error. And so I issue a governmental cautionary warning you know, like the ones they, they put on almost anything. You know, when you walk into a hotel in the state of California, <laughs> uh, there's a warning literally on a plaque bolted to the wall of the hotel as you walk in that uh, the state of California has decided that uh, this hotel might have dangerous substances in it and you should be warned before you go in. So uh, be warned before you listen to this show of the five Uh, predictions that your rabbi presents to you for 2021, please be aware that I'm not merely presenting them as absolute predictions, but I'm presenting them as areas of analysis, areas that I want you to explore and I want you to think about because you may arrive at a different conclusion, but Whatever it is, it'll be your conclusion, and it would be appropriate for you to bear that conclusion in mind as you prepare to make decisions impacting your five Fs for the year 2022 ahead. So um, uh, Henry Ford, you know, this extraordinary uh, person in the first few years of the 20th century, uh, you know, producing a million uh, Model T Fords before he moved on to the next model. Uh, an extraordinary guy, extraordinary. You know, um, on the Tennessee River in, 19, uh, in 1914, maybe, somewhere around about the beginning of World War I, uh, the United States of America was extremely concerned that their access to the ingredients of explosives, uh, nitrates and phosphates, were being imported largely from South America. And the government put a dam, I think it's called, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's now called the Wilson Dam, over the Tennessee River, um, right near the town. And a, a lot of people don't know there really is a place with this name. Some people think it's just made up from music. But no, there is a town called Muscle Shoals in Alabama. And on the Tennessee River there, they they built the Wilson Dam. And uh, turned out the war ended before they actually finished the dam. So the government just stopped because in those days, the government was much more reluctant to spend money than it is today. And Henry Ford, if you don't mind, offered the United States government $5 million to take over the dam. He would pay to complete the dam, install the hydroelectric equipment, produce the hydroelectric electricity, uh, create several towns along the banks of the Tennessee River in the vicinity of the Wilson Dam. And uh, he would then uh, build nitrate and phosphate factories and complete the work that uh, hadn't been done by uh, by the time World War I ended. Well, uh, they seemed fairly interested in taking on Henry Ford's offer until a socialist-leaning uh, member of the United States Congress said, no, no one person should profit from this. It's a national resource. The river belongs to all Americans, and the government must keep it. Well, uh, it turned out, actually, that the government did end up uh, completing that dam. And what's more, it became the uh, premier uh, achievement of the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that went on to to build many more dams 
that tamed the Tennessee River and other rivers in the area for navigation and created huge amounts of hydroelectricity, which opened up the area to industry and uh, also had to do with why work on creating the atom bomb in 1944-1945 was done in that vicinity because of the availability of uh, large amounts of hydroelectricity. Anyway, I'm telling you this, you know, Henry Ford, important guy, and he had a a lawyer. His chief lawyer was a guy called Horace Rackham, and um, Horace Rackerman, Rackerman was going to invest in the fledgling Ford Motor Company. Now, in 1903, it was at the beginning of the company. Henry Ford had not yet developed the, uh, the assembly line method. But nonetheless, I mean, he was making cars. And the president of the Michigan Savings Bank was a financial advisor to Horace Rackham, who was a legal advisor to Henry Ford. And here is what the uh, president of the Michigan Savings Bank told Horace Rackham in 1903. He said, quote, the automobile is a fad. It's a novelty. Horses are here to stay. (laughs) And um, uh, how about the United States Postmaster General in 1959? Okay, so um, this is, uh, you know, we're talking about 10 years before man landed on the moon. That was in July 1969. And 10 years earlier, Arthur Summerfield is the U.S. Postmaster General. And this is what he said. Before man reaches the moon, your mail will be delivered in hours from New York to Australia by guided missiles. We stand right at the brink of an era of rocket-powered mail. (laughs) Well, frankly, if our mail could be delivered from New York to Los Angeles in days, let alone hours, we'd be grateful. But even that isn't happening. All that happens is that the United States Postal Service keeps on requiring more money to deliver less and less services. I think you could safely say that the United States Postal Service, the USPS, is primarily a pension and benefits organization with a small side business of delivering mail and packages. They certainly are not fulfilling Arthur Summerfield's prediction. Uh, Time magazine, 1966. And, you know, I mean, think about it. Time magazine predicted in 1966, remote shopping, while entirely feasible, will certainly flop. It has no chance of success. And uh, and this is why, my dear happy warriors, this is why I urge you to exercise extreme caution whenever you hear things like, say, experts say, or studies reveal, or research shows. Be careful about experts and studies and research Because in 1966, the best researchers at one of the most successful magazines in the world, Time magazine at the time, claimed that remote shopping, while feasible, will certainly flop. It has no chance of success. Um, in, uh, In the 1970s, a Jewish guy whose parents immigrated to America from the Ukraine, and I'll, I mention that because one of my predictions has to do with the Ukraine, Um, So this guy's name is Martin Cooper, and he invented, he was working for Motorola, and he invented the first handheld cellular phone. Uh, It was 1973, by the way, and he led the team that developed it and brought it to market 10 years later in 1983. Uh, Martin Martin Cooper is considered the father of the mobile phone and is also cited as the very first person in human history to ever make a phone call with a handheld cellular phone in 1973. So the guy's no slouch. And here is what he said in 1981. Mobile phones will absolutely never replace the wired telephone. (laughs) Well, mobile phones have replaced the wired phone, 
Firstly, in many countries, in Africa, wired phones are almost unknown, and it's only cell phones. And uh, many people in the United States have ended their wired phone service and now only use cell phones. Uh, Steve Chen was the guy who founded YouTube. And in 2005, he was very skeptical about whether YouTube was going to succeed 16 years ago. He said, I don't know. There just aren't that many videos I would want to watch. So there's the guy who founded YouTube, and he was the absolute worst guy to listen to if you were thinking of maybe investing in YouTube. Uh, Albert Einstein. Okay, Albert Einstein probed the atom. Albert Einstein was the one who, in World War II, sent a letter to the President of the United States speaking about the uh, potential of an atomic bomb. And uh, in 1932, 10, uh, ten years earlier, uh, Einstein wrote the following. There is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be attainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. Well, he was wrong. But if you couldn't believe Albert Einstein about atoms and atomic energy, who could you believe? I think you're getting the idea, right? Uh, the commissioner, a commissioner of the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC, which runs and governs all communication in the United States, phone, radio, television, everything. He said in 1961, there is practically no chance that satellites will ever improve telephone, television, or radio reception within the United States. There is practically no chance that satellites will ever improve telephone, television, or radio reception within the United States. He was wrong. Uh, here's a good one. I always remember this one, by the way. It always sticks with me. As recently as 1981, Bill Gates, you, you know who he is, right? He was At this time, he was the CEO of Microsoft. And he said, nobody will ever need more than 640 kilobytes of memory in a computer. 640 kilobytes ought to be enough for anybody. 640 kilobytes. And so uh, I've got in my very ordinary computer that I, I, I refer to, I have six gigabytes of memory. And many people who use their computers for things like vi video editing that are memory intensive uh, have even more than that. Well, six gigabytes, what is that, a million times more than 640 kilobytes? I haven't done the arithmetic. It might even be more than that. But uh, bottom line is Bill Gates was stupendously wrong on that. Uh, going back a bit further, Western Union ran communications. Every, I mean, communi telegraphic communications are all in the hands of Western Union. Uh, people used to even say, instead of saying, I want to send a telegram, they'd say, I want to send a Western Union. Anyway, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who had invented the telephone in the uh, last years of the 20th century, uh, excuse me, 19th century. It was uh, somewhere around about 1880 or somewhere thereabouts. Uh, he came up with a telephone, but he lacked the money to, to develop it and to bring it to market. So he went to offer it to Western Union, obvious choice, the folks whose name is synonymous with uh, communication. And William Orton, who was the president of Western Union at the time, turned Alexander Graham Bell down and said, this telephone of yours has far too many shortcomings to be taken seriously as a means of communication. It has objectively no value at all. And um, obviously, uh, the reason that you don't hear much about Western Union anymore is precisely because he turned down the telephone. This is the guy who is the president of the world's premier company of communication. And he dismisses the invention of the telephone as completely valueless. Um, I used to read Popular Mechanics magazine regularly as a young boy. And um, I wasn't yet uh, 
reading Popular Mechanics in 1949. That's quite a few years before I started reading it. But nonetheless, in 1949, uh, and I, I kept my back issues for so many years, but a 1949 issue says um, a calculator, the ENIAC computer, has 18,000 vacuum tubes and it weighs 30 tons. But we must realize that computers of the future may have only a 1,000 vacuum tubes. And fanciful as it might seem, they could even weigh less than one and a half tons. <laughs> that one, I don't really laugh at them for that because it's 1949 and they hadn't yet even foreseen that vacuum tubes would be replaced by transistors. But uh, still, funny, uh, you know, To there they are. The first vacuum tube computer, ENIAC, is running, and they are speculating about maybe the weight of a computer could be brought down to one and a half tons. Uh, you have computers in your car that, uh, that, that weigh less than an ounce. Why should we make this? The global potential market for copying machines is 5,000 at the absolute most. Um, the guys who invented the uh, copier machine tried to sell it to IBM. IBM dismissed it. They said there's no market for copying machines. And so they went off themselves and they started a company called Xerox. Right? The rest is history. Uh, the uh, founder of Digital Equipment Corp, as late as 1977, he said there's no reason an individual would ever want to computer in their home. That was 1977, so awfully close to the emergence of the home computer, right? Just a few years ahead, and they, he didn't see it. Um, Steve Barmer, who was the chief executive officer of Microsoft, uh, off, after Bill Gates handed over that position to Steve Barmer, as late as 2007, he said there is no chance of the iPhone ever gaining significant market share. You know, at the time, anybody, anything that Stephen Barmer said, people listened to. After all, the CEO of Microsoft, what would he not know about technology? Um, Paul Krugman, this one I don't really, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you this because I think it's funny. I, Paul Krugman is an economics columnist for the uh, New York Times. I don't think he ever gets anything right. In fact, I'm beginning to think that if I would make investments based on the opposite of everything that Paul Krugman says, I'd probably do pretty well. And um, he said in 1998, the internet will fade away because most people have nothing to say to each other. Um, he says by 2005, it should be clear that the internet's impact on the global economy has been insignificant, no more than the fax machine. And that's Paul Krugman of the New York Times. Uh, he couldn't have been more spectacularly wrong unless his name was Lord Kelvin, one of the most famous British scientists of the 19th century. And this one in 1895 writes, heavier than air flying machines are physically impossible. Whatever Lord Kelvin said about science, the British government followed because Lord Kelvin was the most eminent scientist of his day. And so this is 1895. And again, it's literally only a few years before the Wright brothers flew the first plane. It's like literally just a, a few years. And he says heavier than air flying machines, he doesn't say are unlikely, he says are physically impossible, period. They cannot possibly happen. So that, that gives you all you, you really need to know, doesn't it? So uh, you've got to be careful with predictions, uh, particularly if they're about the future. <laughs> and um, remember, again, I'm not giving you these predictions in order to show you how clever I am, because I don't think I am particularly, uh, but I think that uh, I am giving them to you because I'm hoping you'll be able to make use of them, either in saying, yeah, you know what, the rabbi is correct, or alternatively, you might say, you know what, the rabbi is wrong, and here's why. And during the process of that analysis that you diligently go through, 
you more than likely will light upon some idea or insight that will serve you very well indeed. And so I want these to be for you almost more as stimulation than prediction. But I'm going to give them to you as predictions. Okay, there are five of them I'm sharing with you today. And uh, the first one is um, blockchain technology. Now, blockchain technology is the way that Bitcoin works. And uh, and the, the basic idea, you know, I think the best way I know of for, for giving you an idea of how it works is you know that over the last number of years, there is, there's been all kinds of wonderful software for people to collaborate at work. One of the simplest is Google Docs. And what's nice about that is that when uh, I am working on a Thought Tools or Susan Lappin is working on Amusing, she might do it on, on uh, Google Docs, and I can see what she's writing in real time. And if I want a suggestion, if I want to make an edit, it's right there. And so if even if she loses her computer at that moment, it doesn't matter because the information is on mine. That is a simplified explanation of what blockchain technology does. In an automated and hands-off way, it allows very uh, reliable records to be maintained across many, many, many different corners of the internet. And that way it becomes impossible for me to uh, to uh, fraudulently uh, make a change to a document because if it is on blockchain technology, then there are thousands of other copies of it and the error will be found and corrected. Now, Ordinarily, if I would say to you, what's blockchain technology used for? And you say, well, it's, it's used for cryptocurrency, and you're absolutely right. My prediction is that we're going to see blockchain technology used for many more things. And so one way you might decide to make use of this prediction of mine today is you might decide to devote a certain amount of time in 2022, to learning blockchain technology. Maybe it means you'll be able to get a a better job as a blockchain technician. Maybe you'll be able to uh, come up with a new usage of it. Whatever it is, um, my prediction about blockchain technology, if you give it any credence, then you should make sure that you have and you develop and you work on getting very well equipped to understand and work with blockchain technology. And, and just some of the ways that uh, this, this could start happening. Uh, one of the uh, questions on in, in any real estate transaction, whether it's in um, Beverly Hills or in Bangkok, it doesn't make any difference. Um, one has to know that the person selling you the piece of real estate actually owns it. And sometimes the uh, finding of title and the securing of title can take a long time and uh, can even harm the transaction. And so what if it turns out that title, property title, is put onto blockchain technology? So is that uh, when a, a guy in Bangkok wants to come into a bank in Beverly Hills and do a transaction on a little piece of property he owns in downtown Bangkok, it can be immediately established reliably that he indeed owns it and is entitled to, uh, to encumber it with a mortgage or to sell it, whatever it is. And so um, I think that uh, it's possible that using blockchain – uh, title can be established almost instantaneously, which would be incredible. Um, another area might be in the area of copyrights. And um, uh, I'm just, I'm thinking of uh, sometimes people write books or they write music or uh, sometimes works of art. And again, it's, it seems to me possible that uh, the whole system of royalty payments 
could be done through blockchain technology, again, so as that, um, you know, every time the radio plays a song, there's a small royalty payment that has to be forwarded to the owner of that song. This could conceivably be done very transparently and very quickly using blockchain, I think. And finally, it would appear to me that given that uh, the air, and I'm, I'm just giving you these three areas, all right, uh, real estate, uh, intellectual property rights, and then possibly medical information as well, because, uh, you know, we're going to need more and more rapid uh, transmission of medical information. It's going to have to get a whole lot better than it is right now. And uh, it's very possible that if that was done on blockchain, security is there, it is reliable, and uh, both patients and the medical care industry could benefit from the easy access to 100% reliable information. Um, the, The blockchain technology... Uh, could immediately verify whether a patient is insured. And um, uh, even I'm thinking of drug trials and clinical trials could all identify, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the most likely candidates through through a blockchain-based system uh, that, on which patients' medical records could be reliably and securely placed. So uh, that's my first prediction, that blockchain technology will spread widely and rapidly from just cryptocurrency to many really important areas. And so um, you might be thinking of how you could use blockchain technology in your business, uh, or maybe you'll be thinking of, hey, I could make myself more useful to more people by becoming knowledgeable and skilled in blockchain technology. So if you think there is any value to that prediction, you know what to do. Let's go to prediction number two. Uh, Prediction number two is that uh, China will absorb Taiwan into greater China. But the, uh, um, you know, that's fairly common, right? Plenty of people give you that prediction. My prediction, however, is that uh, all the discussions about Will America defend Taiwan against a Chinese invasion? Or should America defend Taiwan against a a Chinese invasion? I believe all of that's utterly meaningless and irrelevant because I think China will absorb Taiwan without a single bullet being fired. Not uh, not a single bomb will be exploded and it'll all happen very simply and very straightforwardly. Why do I say that? Because... um, in a way that is rather, uh, I find it alarmingly rapid, Taiwan is moving towards a world in which China is far more important to it than the United States is. What do I mean? Well, um, the the, uh, Netherlands Central Planning Bureau, so it's an interesting organization in Holland, um, they... Uh, do they release figures regularly about world trade. And they recently showed data which reveals a 30% increase in China's exports during the COVID period. That's right. Since COVID began, China's exports increased by 30%. The exports from the United States, Europe, and Japan, well, did they also show increases? No, they showed declines. And so China exports up 30% during COVID, the United States down, Europe down, Japan down. That shows a realignment of world trade, which in my view, as I look ahead for 2022, that has really significant ramifications uh, for many countries, but I'm talking mostly about Taiwan right now. <clears throat> um, now, how about China importing stuff? Well, this is also interesting because what is China importing? And the answer is they're mostly importing components, electronic components, and raw material. 
So they're importing oil, they're importing from which they make plastic as well as derive energy. Um, they import uh, a lot of timber and they import uh, electronic components. During the COVID period, which you know, again, you, you know that I've been interested in the changes in the world during the COVID period. So uh, one of the, the changes is that Chinese exports went up by 30%, which is huge. Uh, but how about China's imports from the rest of Asia? Well, it doubled during the COVID period. It doubled from uh, December 2019. It was $18 billion a month that China was importing. And uh, they and, by, and now it's $36 billion a month. So China's imports doubled. But here's the interesting thing. Who did they most dramatically increase their imports from? Yep, you got it. The island nation of Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan's exports to China went up by 50% during this period. Way, way more than its exports to the United States over the same period. Mostly what Taiwan was exporting to China was electronic components for China's assembly industry. And so your iPhone assembled in China from components that China imported from Taiwan. And that probably accounts for a large part of that increase. That's very, very significant. Uh, how about United States exports to China? Well, I looked at the 10 years. I didn't just look at COVID. I looked at 10 years from um, 2010 up to the present time. Here we are at the end of 2021 and uh, didn't go up at all. Stayed absolutely stagnant. China imports from the United States stagnant for the last 10 years. That is a very bad sign. Um, a few more figures. I just I want you to understand when I say that China's going to, my prediction is China's going to take over Taiwan and it'll do so without a shot being fired. Um, that I just want you to, to see some of my background of research why I'm saying this. Let, let me continue because I don't want to, uh, let me not overwhelm you with numbers and statistics, but uh, <clears throat> these are really important figures. And although they're sort of macro figures, you know, they're figures that affect a country, nonetheless, that does show you certain really important geopolitical trends. For instance, um, Taiwan's uh, exports to China, right? Taiwan is now on an annualized basis exporting about $300 billion a year to China. Well, here's the important thing. That's going on. That's beginning to approach half of its GDP. Um, that, you can, you can call that almost total economic integration. So if these two places are so integrated economically, then everything else becomes merely a formality. And so, again, just to clarify that, China, excuse me, Taiwan exports to China so much that it's almost a half of everything they produce. Think about this. Let's imagine you have a business and you make widgets or you sell shoes or whatever it is you do. And you have one customer who accounts for half of your annual revenue. Doesn't that worry you? Well, it would unless it turns out that customer is a company controlled by your husband. Or it's a company controlled by your brother or your son or your father. And then you say, oh, well, that's fine. That's okay. I don't mind that. But if it's a arm's length company that buys so much from you that it's a half of your annual revenue, well, not to sound ridiculous, but what you might say is, I think we may need to get married. Right? You see the point. Um, so, uh, Needless to say, there's this huge imbalance 
China exports to us way, way more than we export to China. But that's, that's not all. In other words, when we speak about uh, China taking over Taiwan, as I predict will happen, uh, and will happen without a bullet being fired, it's not only a, str- a case of, chi- of uh, Taiwan's dependence on China uh, and increasing dependence on China and growing independence from the United States, but it's also China's growing strength. And um, one of the ways we see this is that huh, this this is very sad for me to speak about. Um, this really, really um, is sad. Um, all right. Well, I've got to say it because it has to do with America's embarrassing and horrible, humiliating uh, retreat from Afghanistan. You know, <clears throat> when, um, and let's admit it, when, when America bugged out of Vietnam, it was also humiliating, it was also a defeat, it was also <clears throat> terrible, but there were no nations around the world at the time saying, oh, well, this shows a weakness of America. It, nobody was doing that. And, you know, nobody nobody attacked our interests much after that. It, it happened, it was bad, but the, the, there were not real consequences to it immediately. Everything is different now. Let, let me explain. Um, America's power, and this is true for any country, obviously, a country's power is dependent on what I call the two C's, capability and credibility. Number one capability is you've got to have the ability, the capability to project power. Do you actually have a, a military with the ability to project that power? Do you have the capability? But if you do, it's not enough. You also have the, to have the credibility. There has to be a belief that you care about yourself enough to take care of your own interests. You've got to be seen not to be a coward. And uh, unfortunately, Afghanistan sent the message loud and clear that America probably doesn't have the capability anymore, but even if it did, it certainly doesn't have the credibility anymore. And who took this message? Well, um, several important players. Obviously, Israel is concerned. Obviously, other players in the Middle East are interested in this, Iran notably, but also Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, also very aware of how much loss of credibility America experienced with the Afghanistan retreat. Pardon me. And so... Uh, But that's not all. The main observers of America's humiliating defeat in Afghanistan, two nations, Russia and China, looking at it all very, very carefully. And um, what it did, I I can only uh, tell you, again, this is part of my China-Taiwan prediction, but I see that China and Russia uh, become far more allied. Um, they uh, they are both now on the odds, on the outs with the United States of America. I mean, can you believe it? Uh, soon after his, it was a fair, well, in, in the first year of his administration, uh, President Biden called um, President Putin. He said he's a heartless, evil killer. Never before, outside of wartime, have statesmen spoken to one another like that. And it is such an unwise thing and so imprudent uh, and so childish and uh, indicative of cognitive decline that President Biden did such a thing. But all it did was uh, make our relationship with Russia even worse. Afghanistan assured Russia that it has no... um, nothing to fear from the United States. And now China and Russia are going to most likely, part of my prediction, form a closer alliance. And apart from anything else, they both face a common threat. 
which is Islamic Jihad on their borders. Both China and Russia are fearful of uh, Islamic um, minorities on their borders and very possibly with good reason as well. And so uh, all of these things are going on and I'm looking at all of these things. And so when I say that uh, China will take Taiwan and it will take it in an utterly bloodless manner, I, I'm basing it on my take, and I'm telling you this so that you can easily dismiss what I'm saying, if you wish, by just exploring the undermining of the the underpinning factors that I'm using, uh, or or not as as you wish. But uh, I'm I'm watching the United Arab Emirates used to be very much a strong ally of the United States, so much so that President Trump was able to persuade them to move ahead with a uh, the beginnings of a uh, peace with Israel, even though this meant violating a long-standing uh, Middle East tradition that the Palestinian issue must be settled before anything else. Well, that's not what President Trump and the United Arab Emirates did, but now it's all been squandered. And um, you remember America's uh, battle with China over Huawei technologies with 5G, uh, and America said we're not going to use Huawei technology, and they, they try to make their allies around the world not use Chinese. Hi- I'm pronouncing that wrongly, I'm sure, but it's um, H-U-A-W-E-I, Huawei uh, te- technologies. I'm sorry, I should have checked up the correct pronunciation of that, but um, <clears throat> but you've been reading for a year or more, as I have, that Huawei is a major supplier of 5G broadband equipment, and um, America tried to pressure the United Arab Emirates not to use this Chinese technology for their broadband rollout. And uh, and America leaned on the UAE the following way. By the way, this is amazing. If if you didn't know this, this is fascinating. But I'm sure being a well-informed, happy warrior, you probably already know this. The United States said to the United Arab Emirates, if you insist on going ahead and buying Chinese technology, we will no longer, we will not sell you the F-35 fighter. That's going to end. We're no longer going to sell it to you. Do you know what UAE did? They said, let us tell you what you can do with your F-35. And they turned their back on it. They bought their 5G equipment from China. And guess what? They're in the process of buying 80 fighter planes from France, the French Rafale fighter. And when um, I explored this a little bit, here's what I discovered. The F-35 is a Lockheed product, obviously. But um, do you remember me mentioning a while back that there were these riots in South Africa and the rioters, uh, looters, stole uh, a few dozen Samsung big large screen televisions. And I told you that Samsung disabled the TV's remote control and they made them worthless. Well, Lockheed maintains regular contact with every one of their airplanes they manufacture. And they, uh, they monitor the use of the airplane, they monitor the mechanical status, and everything that's going on on the airplane, ostensibly in order to be able to provide uh, immediate service as needed. But the bottom line is that I have no doubt whatsoever that Lockheed can remotely, if you like, lock an F-35 anywhere in the world. They can press a button and disable the fighter plane. That's what I believe. That's my, that's my viewpoint. The technology is there, and, I, and I'm sure it's in collaboration with the United States government as the, 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 the customer for these airplanes, but I'm quite sure that that's uh, exactly, I mean, I, I just am positive that Lockheed would have the technical ability to do this is without question. You all know that to be true. Uh, they'd come to the United States government and say, by the way, we could build into the airplanes the ability to not only monitor them, but also press a button and disable the plane. 
Well, the government would say, no, don't do that. Now, of course, they'd want to be able to do that just in case. You know, let's imagine planes fell into enemy hands or whatever. Yeah, it'd be great to be able to disable them so they can't be used against our own forces. So uh, UAE says, you know what? Keep your F-35. We don't want it. We'll go ahead and buy the um, French Rafale fighter. And guess what? It does not come with any monitoring uh, ability whatsoever. And so who knows? What if the United Arab Emirates down the road decides they want to get uh, Iran under control? Maybe together with Saudi Arabia, they decide, you know what, we've got to do something with Iran. Here's a thought. How about they decide to do it in collaboration with Israel? At that point, they really wouldn't want the American government to tell Lockheed to disable their fighters. And so between that and not wanting the U.S. to control their, gosh, we're talking about a lot of international politics uh, in today's show. But all of this is, is part of the reason why I make my China prediction with respect to uh, Taiwan. And by the way, it's not only the United Arab Emirates that is trying to make itself um, independent of the United States, as if they don't trust the United States any longer, right? Maybe they feel that America doesn't have the capability anymore, and maybe it certainly doesn't have the credibility anymore, right? Maybe. How about Taiwan's chip fabricators? This was a very interesting thing. I remember early in 2021, uh, no, I'm sorry, not early 2021, late 2021, early early this month of December, uh, Taiwan's chip fabricators all signed a mutual agreement to create their own semiconductor equipment industry. What does this mean? In order to make semiconductors, you need certain machines, and most of those machines up till now have been available from the United States. Taiwan is saying we want to be able to be independent. What we don't want is America to expand its rules about who we sell soft um, semiconductors to because uh, <clears throat> uh, the United States um, imposes rules when Taiwan buys fabrication, chip fabrication plants from the United States, the United States retains the right to block sales of chips produced on those machines. And so Taiwan is saying, we don't want to be in a position where America can prevent us from selling chips to China, given, as I've already told you on a separate part of the discussion, that China represents a major, the most important uh, importer, purchaser of China, of Taiwanese exports. So, of course, they don't want America to have control. So, of course, they want to have their own chip fabrication plants. Maybe China will develop them and sell them to Taiwan. But whatever it is, this strengthens China and weakens the United States. And so, any, any threat that America posed, uh, any tendency that America served to dissuade China from taking over Taiwan, to me, that seems to be just diminishing so rapidly, it's almost falling through the floor. Um, so, um, China, uh, he, uh, something else on chip-making machines, by the way, uh, I saw... You know, you know, I follow a number of newspapers and magazines so as that you do not have to. For instance, did you know that, again, a few, two weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that the Department of Defense, the United States Department of Defense, is trying to stop China's largest chip maker from purchasing American chip making machinery. So you see, what, I mean, this is all really important stuff. Uh, chips and chip making. I mean, you even know that America's car industry has been hurt by shortages of chips. So obviously, uh, we're talking about very important stuff, let alone uh, building fighter planes. And uh, so all of these suggest a, an alignment of China and Taiwan, because between China and Taiwan, at that point, America is no longer 
the world's most important semiconductor uh, brain pool. It now shifts to China, Taiwan. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I've spoken before uh, of America uh, and other countries. I I like Bill Maher's suggestion that it's an issue of seriousness and silliness, right? And uh, and so, I mean, silly to to label the president of another country an evil killer. I mean, what do you think? How? It's unbelievable. But that's silly. That's just plain silliness. Um, seriousness is to talk about chip making. And, uh, and when, you, when you meet with China and you're having a big meeting with China in connection with uh, issues like Taiwan and issues of trade, uh, and you waste your time talking about climate change, which is exactly what President Biden did, that's silly. So um, China is very serious. President Biden is very silly. Uh, another instance of silliness is um, the Biden administration was really no more than a, a couple of months old when in about a 10-day period, they uh, threatened sanctions against five different countries, two of whom were uh, U.S. allies. They threatened sanctions against uh, Germany, India, Russia, and China. Germany, India, Russia, and China. I said five, four. Uh, Germany and India are kind of supposed to be American allies. Why do you issue sanction threats against, China, against Germany and, and uh, India, our allies? And... Uh, Oh, fine, you're going you're gonna to threaten sanctions against Russia and China. I get it. But threatening sanctions is a very weak and silly position because, once again, it establishes lack of credibility. Uh, it's been shown repeatedly that when you issue sanctions against a country, you're actually helping the country. Short-term hurt, very short-term. Long-term, you're helping the country because they stretch their muscles in order to find ways around the sanctions, and they invariably do. So um, Germany is building a natural gas pipeline with Russia, right? And America, instead of being able to say to Germany, you may not do that, which they don't have the ability to do, they say, if you do it, we'll threaten you with sanctions. Germany thumbs their nose. They're, they're going ahead with their pipeline with Russia. <clears throat> that pipeline with Russia, by the way, means that Germany can import gas, natural gas from Russia, without it going through Ukraine. And you can see what the significance of that is when it comes to my third uh, prediction. And um, uh, <clears throat> the, um, uh, where, what, okay, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for just a moment. So um, uh, China um, being serious, America being silly. Uh, by the way, you know why they, um, uh, why they, why President Biden issued warnings to India? Because they purchased an air defense system from Russia, not from the United States. Why do you suppose they did that? Maybe Biden, instead of getting angry at India for buying a Russian military system, Maybe he ought to be asking himself, hey, why did they buy that from Russia and not from Lockheed Martin in, uh, in the United States? Why? He should ask that because looking inwards and finding your own flaws is always more painful but always more useful than pointing a finger at other people. Uh, why, did, um, uh, why did he issue sanction warnings to Russia and China? Um, well, he threatened President Putin because he didn't like the way that uh, President Putin treats his political allies, and he didn't like the way China treats its Muslim Ugyar minority. Okay, that shouldn't be America's problem. I understand that it goes against Western values, but since when is it the job of America to impose its value system? on other countries. It makes its value system available. You can copy us. We, we, we're amazingly generous. Uh, but to force it, 
Like, where, where does this come from? That we have to imperil American national interests because we have to punish China because we don't like the way they're dealing with their Muslim minority. Really? And this is an American problem? It's, it's a strange thing. And by the way, President Trump understood this well. But the uh, imposing of our values on other nations, it's wrong and it causes a great deal of resentment on other nations, legitimate resentment, because they're not 100% sure that American values have yet been proven to be such an extraordinary success. So uh, there it is. Right now, America has lost a lot of influence in the Middle East. China and Russia are going to pick up and join in. And you know who's going to be a linchpin of this Russian-Chinese alliance in establishing order in the Middle East? Good old Israel is. That's who. Uh, Israel, um, considerable interaction with China. I've reported on this to you before. Uh, when I was lost in Israel, I began to explore the extraordinary connections between Israel and China. And I told you about it at the time. But Israel also has remarkably good relationships with Russia. And, um, and, and that's a very, very real thing. It's, it's, it's kind of important. Um, you know, while Biden demonizes uh, Putin, uh, nobody's paying attention at all that, uh, that Russia's President Putin is, is a very important guy in, in international politics. And, um, and he is, um, he has very friendly relations with Israel. I don't know if you knew that, but you should know that. Uh, President Putin is close. He was very close to Netanyahu and, um, he, uh, he, he, he has made it clear that he gives Israel a free hand in suppressing Iranian troublemaking in Syria. You've seen that. You've seen that Israel has dealt very severely with the Iranian um, uh, troublemaking in, in Syria, and Russia's okay with that. And I'll, I will tell you this, I know personally, that uh, President Putin's relationship with the Jewish community in Russia is warm and strong. I would say this. I would say that uh, Jews in Russia have a much warmer relationship with Putin than Jews in America have with Biden. That's kind of where it's at, I'm afraid. Awful, isn't it? But, but it's, it's really, unfortunately, a reality. So all of that uh, flows naturally to my third prediction, which is that Russia takes Ukraine. Whether that happens with bullets or without, I'm not sure. Obviously, I'm afraid my crystal ball is a little bit cloudy on that. It needs uh, a little bit of rubbing with, double, with uh, I was going to say, WD-40, because you can use WD-40 for almost anything, but not for window cleaning. I think we need Windex for that. But, um, but that Russia will take Ukraine. Um, I've got that on my 2022 uh, prediction list as well. And um, so, so there we've got uh, my five predictions, one, two, and three. Blockchain technology, Taiwan and Ukraine are one, two, and three. Here's number four. My fourth prediction is that technology is going to go to, ex to apply to far more than electronics. And uh, I want you to think about this for a moment because today when we use the word tech, technology, high tech, all you're thinking of is uh, electronics, right? Uh, a new device, a new screen, a, a new way of running your iPhone or whatever it is. But that's what you think of. And what I want to explain is that from the very first time that a man lit a fire, that's been technology. Technology is not synonymous with electronics. Technology is making the world an easier, more comfortable place in which to live. That's what technology is. And so um, if I sort of jump through periods and look at technology in periods, I'm not, I'm not exactly down to the year here. I'm not going to uh, be pedantic about 
but in in rough in rough eras, seventeen fifty. What was technology? Do you think there was no technology in seventeen fifty? Of course there was. Technology in seventeen fifty meant steam power. It meant uh, cutting canals. Right, Europe crisscrossed with canals in seven in the seventeen fifty period. Um, mechanical fabric making, right? Very interesting. The spinning jenny and uh, and uh, preparing cotton for fabric manufacture. So, by the way, what's so interesting about that is that there was a man, a British economist called Thomas Malthus, M A L T H U S. Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus is notorious for having, again, been one of the worst predictors in all of history. He was the one who said that uh, people are going to be starving to death by the year 1800, and by the year 1850, people will be walking around naked because people there are going to be too many people. We're not going to be able to uh, clothe the people. And he's making these predictions not even aware that in the British Midlands, not far from where he lived, Inventors were coming up with machinery that would drop the cost of clothing by so much that it was unimaginable. Up till then, an ordinary Englishman might have had one or two uh, changes of clothing. You know, that was it. Clothing was very expensive. It consumed a, a huge amount of your year's economic output had to go on clothing. So you obviously didn't have much of it. And so Malthus said, well, this is going to continue. Uh, we're not going to get any faster making clothing. The more and more people, you're going to have people dying of cold. They'll be naked. Well, he was wrong because while he was in his university writing his papers on starving and freezing people, uh, mechanical clothing making was taking off. And as I say, think of it as the 1750s. Uh, 1800, what, what did technology mean in the period? I'm looking at 1800 now. Uh, the sewing machine, again, having to do with manufacture of clothes, this was cutting edge technology. And so if you were a young person in interested in getting into the cutting edge of technology in this period of the 1800s, you would get into clothing manufacture and making of machinery for clothing and also um, weapons. You would, uh, the revolver is invented in that period as well. Uh, 1850, let's jump ahead 50 years. Okay, you're interested in technology in the 1850s. What are you talking about? Transport, that's all. Railways, steamships, and the first dawning of the sign of electronics, 1844. So let's, I'm, I'm calling it 1850. The telegraph, Samuel Morse um, sending a message electronically on a copper wire between uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., um, and that was that period as well. Uh, so communication and transport is going on. Also, steel making. That's the period where steel's price drops dramatically. Up till then, a lot of stuff had been done with iron, you know, railways for train, iron, with all the problems of iron. Great bridges were being built, iron. All of a sudden, the Bessemer steel converter technology came about. And many of the bright young minds of that period went into steel because that was technology. Technology means much more than electronics. And so my uh, my prediction for 2022 is that it's going to become clear that technology goes way beyond and that electronics is perhaps not necessarily the most important aspect of uh, technology. So what should you take away from this? That you should be very open to other areas. If you're interested in tech, maybe you should look outside the area of electronics because there's going to be a whole lot going on there as well. Um, by the way, the machine gun, 1875, again, weapons. Uh, a lot of um, medical stuff starts there. Anesthesia, the idea of being able to eliminate pain during operations, that's cutting-edge technology. Just starting, magnetism, electricity, electric motor, Edison's phonograph, and the light bulb, these are starting to happen. No electronics per se, but we're starting to see electricity happen. And as I said, the machine gun as well. 1900, 
And now we see the 20th century and electronics. 1900 is wireless uh, and, again, heavier than air plane, heavier than air, airplanes. The Wright brothers in 1903. Um, just before that, there's the first Zeppelin, the first commercial airship. Uh, so airplane tr- air, air transport is happening in this period, right? Uh, radio broadcasting is happening. The internal combustion engine is becoming really viable. And again, young men who are interested in uh, in technology, um, what is that movie about the Biddles? It's, it's a, a really fun, um, like it's, it's, it's 50 years old. Um, I forget what it was called, but it was about a millionaire, a real-life millionaire called Biddle, and his daughter fell in love with a young guy who um, wants to go to Detroit to get in on the car industry. And that's what was happening. Um, bright young people interested in technology. It was internal combustion engine, uh, car building. That was the cutting edge of technology. Um, 1925, refrigeration, air conditioning, um television starting, and again, a whole lot more medical stuff, insulin for diabetes, penicillin, all of this, 19, the period, let's call it 1925. 1950, transistors, solid state, uh, the birth control pill, medicine, uh, plastics, the emergence of plastics, Bakelite, nylon, terylene, artificial fabrics, uh, polyethylene bottles began to replace glass bottles, and um, so, again, you remember there was a scene in uh, the movie The Graduate, Dustin Hoffman, and um, one of the adults saying to young Dustin Hoffman, who's just graduated from college, and go into plastics. That's the cutting edge. That's technology. And sure enough, uh, for, for that period of time, technology did mean chemicals and plastics. And... Um, um, polycarbonate, all of these things came out through that plastic technology um, revolution. Um, 1975, okay, now we see the personal computer, we see optic, f- fiber optic cabling, and so on and so forth. And then, and then we're thoroughly into the electronic era. But you get the idea, right, that, um, that it's not clear exactly what the other areas will be. However, um, I can tell you this, it's probably going to be very soon that more and more people are going to realize that wind power and solar power are silly, not serious. And that uh, even in countries that have invested significantly more heavily in wind and solar, uh, like Germany, for instance, uh, you're talking about supplying 7% of their needs. Germany, as part of its extended silliness, Germany's silliness knows no limits. I mean, silliness in importing um, millions of, of young male immigrants who had no intention of integrating. The other silliness of Germany is just closing two more nuclear power stations. So um, uh, Germany is, is going to be waking up, whether they're going to need hydroelectric or what it is. But I can tell you that... If you're interested in technology, there's a lot er- a lot of areas where I think you would do a whole lot better in 2022 than in electronics. And one of them, you know, electricity generation, uh, power generation, hydroelectric, uh, natural gas. I mean, all of these areas. So I, I would say, and by the way, I think nuclear power will begin making a comeback in some places. At any rate, um, if if you are trying to decide whether to become an electronics engineer or a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer, I would give very serious thought to civil engineering and mechanical engineering because that's technology, but it's not an often thought of technology and it's going to be increasingly needed, very much there. So, so that is the fourth one of my predictions, which is Tech is going to mean far more than just electronics. And uh, finally, for my fifth prediction, uh, atheism weakens, faith strengthens. Atheism weakens, faith strengthens. That's what I I want to say. Wall Street Journal reported on, uh, I think, the 21st of December, 
that um, faith-based apps are suddenly <clears throat> being funded like a hundred times more than they used to be a few years ago. In other words, venture capital is jumping into the faith market. And there are all kinds of discussions. Should people have to pay for an app that teaches you how to pray, et cetera, et cetera? Lots of discussions. But the main point I took away from the Wall Street Journal is that if the market is beginning to take faith seriously, atheism is on the skids. So be aware of that and uh, lead rather than follow. Uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of teaching and a lot of material I produce on faith. And I stress again that, you know, faith is a lot like making an omelet. You don't get born knowing how to make an omelet. You don't get born knowing how to involve God in your life. There are techniques. There are ways to do it. Okay, and I, I teach that and I talk about it. And please make use of that because um, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. I know that God makes a lot of people embarrassed. But, um, you know, you're going to be on the winning side. 2022, you're going to see more and more vibrant and, uh, and, and powerful and proud proclamation of faith. Uh, so rather lead than follow in that area. Um, we're going to find that um, uh, people will realize that most of the clashes, particularly in the United States of America, are not to be dismissed as, oh, merely political, it's between the left and the right. No, it's not. These are religious values at stake. It would not be a mistake to say that in 2022, you could recognize the uh, clashes in American culture to be a religious war, a war between two mutually incompatible sets of values. It's God versus government. Who is the ultimate authority? Uh, is it about life or is it about death? If it's about life, it's about heterosexual sex. It's about marriage. It's about family. And if it's about death, well, then it's homosexuality, it's transgenderism, it's um, singleness, avoidance of marriage. It's two sets of values, and people are making their choice. Uh, it's about independent wealth or dependence on government. That's the choice. That is a religious value. Do I want to live my life and raise my family to see value in being independently affluent, to be able to have your own money and to be able to enjoy the independence that gives you, or is dependence on government the ultimate goal and owning money is evil? These are religious values. Um, what's most important in society, the family or individualism? These are religious values. And so, my friends, that in uh, brief ends my lineup of predictions for 2022. Again, the five predictions are blockchain technology expanding into a whole lot of other areas. I don't even know what areas, but think about it. Number two, Taiwan and China, a total realignment of geopolitical powers and uh, what does it mean to you and your business and to your family if many countries around the world start feeling that they will be better equipped if they side with China and Russia than if they side with the United States of America? What impact does that have for you? Uh, Ukraine goes, all right, so there are certain implications to that you want to think about. Uh, number four, Technology goes way beyond nuclear, excuse me, way beyond electronics, and it embraces all kinds of technologies that uh, you could enjoy being on the cutting edge without touching electronics. And number five, uh, atheism weakens, faith strengthens, as something we will see happening in the year ahead. Those, my friends, are my five predictions. And um, I'm very much hoping that in one year from now, I will happily say, Ayatollah Yuso, and you may then call me happily Ayatollah Yuso, uh, because I did. 
Uh, but I am very much aware of the possibility, maybe even the likelihood, but I'll stick with possibility, that like the list of terrible predictions I hopefully entertained you with at the beginning of the show, I won't have to say at the end of the year, well, let me tell you five terrible predictions I gave you last December. I hope that that won't be the case, but uh, at any rate, I do hope that uh, you all enjoy a beautiful and uplifting and joyful Christmas and a successful and prosperous and happy new year as you grow your five Fs. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin, wishing you a week of great progress with your family and your faith, your finances and your friendships and your physical fitness. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin, yes indeed, your rabbi, reminding you of how the world really works and saying to you, God bless.